The Psychology of Good Clothes When the good news came from the theater of war on November the 11th, 1918, my worldly possessions amounted to but little more than they did the day I came into the world. The war had destroyed my business and made it necessary for me to make a new start. My wardrobe consisted of three well-worn business suits and two uniforms which I no longer needed. Knowing all too well that the world forms its first and most lasting impressions of a man by the clothes he wears, I lost no time in visiting my tailor. Happily, my tailor had known me for many years, therefore he did not judge me entirely by the clothes I wore. If he had, I would have been sunk. With less than a dollar in change in my pocket, I picked out the cloth for three of the most expensive suits I ever owned, and ordered that they be made up for me at once. The three suits came to three hundred seventy-five dollars. I shall never forget the remark made by the tailor as he took my measure. Glancing first at the three bolts of expensive cloth which I had selected, and then at me, he inquired, Dollar a year, man, eh? No, said I. If I had been fortunate enough to get on the dollar a year payroll, I might now have enough money to pay for these suits. The tailor looked at me with surprise. I don't think he got the joke. One of the suits was a beautiful dark gray, one was a dark blue, the other was a light blue with a pinstripe. Fortunately, I was in good standing with my tailor, therefore he did not ask when I was going to pay for those expensive suits. I knew that I could and would pay for them in due time, but could I have convinced him of that? This was the thought which was running through my mind, with hope against hope that the question would not be brought up. I then visited my haberdasher, from whom I purchased three less expensive suits and a complete supply of the best shirts, collars, ties, hosiery, and underwear that he carried. My bill at the haberdasher's amounted to a little over three hundred dollars. With an air of prosperity, I nonchalantly signed the charge ticket and tossed it back to the salesman with instructions to deliver my purchase the following morning. The feeling of renewed self-reliance and success had begun to come over me, even before I had attired myself in my newly purchased outfit. I was out of the war, and six hundred seventy-five dollars in debt, all in less than twenty-four hours. The following day, the first of the three suits ordered from the haberdasher was delivered. I put it on at once, stuffed a new silk handkerchief in the outside pocket of my coat, shoved the fifty dollars I had borrowed on my ring down into my pants pocket, and walked down Michigan Boulevard in Chicago, feeling as rich as Rockefeller. Every article of clothing I wore, from my underwear out, was of the very best. That it was not paid for was nobody's business except mine and my tailor's and my haberdasher's. Every morning I dressed myself in an entirely new outfit and walked down the same street at precisely the same hour. That hour happened to be the time when a certain wealthy publisher usually walked down the same street on his way to lunch. I made it my business to speak to him each day, and occasionally I would stop for a minute's chat with him. After this daily meeting had been going on for about a week, I met this publisher one day, but decided I would see if he would let me get by without speaking. Watching him from under my eyelashes, I looked straight ahead and started to pass him, when he stopped and motioned me over to the edge of the sidewalk, placed his hand on my shoulder, looked me over from head to foot, and said, you look damned prosperous for a man who has just laid aside a uniform. Who makes your clothes? Well, said I, Wilkie and Celery made this particular suit. He then wanted to know what sort of business I was engaged in. That airy atmosphere of prosperity which I had been wearing, along with a new and different suit every day, had got the better of his curiosity. I had hoped that it would. Flipping the ashes from my Havana Perfecto, I said, Oh, I am preparing the copy for a new magazine that I am going to publish. A new magazine, eh? he queried. And what are you going to call it? It is to be named Hill's Golden Rule. Don't forget, said my publisher friend, that I am in the business of printing and distributing magazines. Perhaps I can serve you also. That was the moment for which I had been waiting. I had that very moment and almost the very spot of ground on which we stood in mind when I was purchasing those new suits. But it is necessary to remind you that conversation never would have taken place had this publisher observed me walking down that street from day to day with a whipped dog look on my face, an unpressed suit on my back, and a look of poverty in my eyes. An appearance of prosperity attracts attention always, with no exceptions whatsoever. Moreover, 
the look of prosperity attracts favorable attention because the one dominating desire in every human heart is to be prosperous. My publisher friend invited me to his club for lunch. Before the coffee and cigars had been served, he had talked me out of the contract for printing and distributing my magazine. I had even consented to permit him to supply the capital without any interest charge. For the benefit of those who are not familiar with the publishing business, may I not offer the information that considerable capital is required for launching a new nationally distributed magazine. Capital in such large amounts is often hard to get, even with the best of security. The capital necessary for launching Hill's Golden Rule magazine, which you may have read, was well above $30,000, and every cent of it was raised on a front created mostly by good clothes. True, there may have been some ability back of those clothes, but many millions of men have ability who never have anything else, and who are never heard of outside of the limited community in which they live. This is a rather sad truth. To some it may seem an unpardonable extravagance for one who is broke to have gone in debt for $675 worth of clothes, but the psychology back of that investment more than justified it. The appearance of prosperity not only made a favorable impression on those to whom I had to look for favors, but of more importance still was the effect that proper attire had on me. I not only knew that correct clothes would impress others favorably, but I knew also that good clothes would give me an atmosphere of self-reliance, without which I could not hope to regain my lost fortunes. I got my first training in the psychology of good clothes from my friend Edwin C. Barnes, who was a close business associate of Thomas A. Edison. Barnes afforded considerable amusement for the Edison staff when, some twenty-odd years ago, he rode into West Orange on a freight train, not being able to raise sufficient money for passenger fare, and announced at the Edison offices that he had come to enter into a partnership with Mr. Edison. Nearly everybody around the Edison plant laughed at Barnes, except Edison himself. He saw something in the square jaw and determined face of young Barnes which most of the others did not see, despite the fact that the young man looked more like a tramp than he did a future partner of the greatest inventor on earth. Barnes got his start sweeping floors in the Edison offices. That was all he sought, just a chance to get a toehold in the Edison organization. From there on he made history that is well worth emulation by other young men who wish to make places for themselves. Barnes has now retired from active business, even though he is still a comparatively young man, and spends most of his time at his two beautiful homes in Bradentown, Florida, and Damariscotta, Maine. He is a multimillionaire, prosperous and happy. I first became acquainted with Barnes during the early days of his association with Edison, before he had arrived. In those days he had the largest and most expensive collection of clothes I had ever seen or heard of one man owning. His wardrobe consisted of thirty-one suits, one for each day of the month. He never wore the same suit two days in succession. Moreover, all his suits were of the most expensive type. Incidentally, his clothes were made by the same tailors who made those three suits for me. He wore socks, which cost six dollars per pair. His shirts and other wearing apparel cost in similar proportion. His cravats were specially made at a cost of from five to seven dollars and a half each. One day, in a spirit of fun, I asked him to save some of his old suits, which he did not need, for me. He informed me that he hadn't a single suit, which he did not need. He then gave me a lesson on the psychology of clothes, which is well worth remembering. I do not wear thirty-one suits of clothes, said he, entirely for the impression they make on other people. I do it mostly for the impression they have on me. Barnes then told me of the day when he presented himself at the Edison plant for a position. He said he had to walk around the plant a dozen times before he worked up enough courage to announce himself, because he knew that he looked more like a tramp than he did a desirable employee. Barnes is said to be the most able salesman ever connected with the great inventor of West Orange. His entire fortune was made through his ability as a salesman, but he has often said that he never could have accomplished the results which have made him both wealthy and famous had it not been for his understanding of the psychology of clothes.